So next topic is reading user manuals. A lot of people don't like to read. That's okay. Because guess what? Adam's got you covered. I have started the RTFM, which stands for Read the Beeping Manual, which is an old engineering term. <laughs> so RTFM series where I read the user manuals for everybody. And um, the reason I do this is because it, it, it saves me time in the future, so I can just refer to that and listen to myself reading it. But it also helps the audio community because I think that there's a lot of important details in these user manuals. And I've learned, I, I think the Audion ID14's user manual is excellent. Talks about a lot of different topics. Um, you know, it, it really, I think audience did a very good job when they wrote that manual. And, you know, this mixing board has a manual. No manual for this. <laughs> it's it's a pretty simple setup anyway. You know, you got your input over here, which also acts as a uh, threshold control. And then next to that, you have your output makeup gain. So really, when you're using this, you're you're adjusting both knobs at the same time. What does that look like? <laughs> and then um, you know, you're you have I believe the the, the top one i don't have my glasses on but it's attack usually now on the stam audio clone they made it so that the fastest setting is counterclockwise and the slowest setting is clockwise but um on your typical 1176 it's backwards now in later models in later clones they fixed that problem but um yeah anyway then you have your ratio switches when I got this, I, I knew exactly what to do because I've used so many 1176 plugins, it, it wasn't funny. Um, the main thing though was I didn't know that the, yeah, it, it has an off switch. It's pretty cool, right? It has an off switch. <laughs> but um, I love the VU meter on this thing. I, that's really, to me, the coolest thing besides the sound quality. I don't use this enough though. And that's the shameful thing. So maybe in a future video, I'll actually have um, this mixing board plugged into that, and then that, that'll run into the line input of the ID14. But um, anyway, getting back, let me, let, me, let me look at my topics here. So this is, I don't think I've talked about this program, or at least if I have it, I don't talk about it enough. So there's a, pro there's a program called Latency Monitor. It's, it's actually spelled Latency, M-O-N, all one word, L-A-T-E, N C Y M O N latency mon. It's a free plugin and it lets you see if there's any programs that are causing buffering issues with your computer setup. A lot of times graphics card drivers can cause issues. Um, just, just weird stuff that you wouldn't even like think that were causing issues might be causing issues. So latency mon free program, try it out use it if you're having issues with glitching it could get to the bottom of them every little step's important but if your audio monitoring is not accurate now accurate can mean so many things but accurate to me means this everybody has different speakers okay even even somebody that has the same speaker as this will be slightly different from this specific speaker by the way i have two more of these i've been meaning to put them in and um you know, I, I mean, I think I've had these speakers for way too long, but I know how these speakers sound. I have new old stock speakers to replace them if, if the driver ever was blown. And in fact, if I replace it, I'm wondering if the woofer, because I haven't used it, I wonder if it's dry rotted on the other speakers. I'm curious about that. Um, anyway, monitoring all the way back to the year 2009. Well, technically this came out before 2009, but I got a copy of IK Multimedia's ARC system, which at the time was version one, as payment for recording and mixing another album um, from, the, from the same musician I was talking about earlier. And um, because I said, look, you know, 
I, I thought I did a good mix job, but the thing is, I know that the monitoring was not perfect. Um, as much as we would like it to be, I, I noticed that, you know, when you go and listen to it on different speaker systems, it doesn't sound as good as it should. So we got ARC, and I don't think we got ARC until I was ready to mix. I, w I wish I would have had ARC when I was recording, um, because what ARC does is you, you, you basically you put this omnidirectional microphone that re that means that sound is picked up mostly everywhere uh, around the capsule, and um, this measurement microphone is then sent, or I should say that these frequency sweeps and other noises come through whatever speakers you're using, and ARC then essentially counteracts that measurement so that your speakers and your room sound flatter than they do they would otherwise. And the idea behind that is, um, I think it was JBL. JBL did a, they, they basically measured the frequency responses of every single different speaker. I don't know about headphones, but speakers. And they, they basically figured out that when you combine all the different speaker profiles, they all cancel each other out and essentially you have a flat speaker response. Um, so ARC aims to do that. And I think the original version was pretty darn good. Version 2 came out. I bought the upgrade. I loved it. Then they released version 2.5, uh, I want to say in the year 2015, maybe? And version 2.5 added the option for what's called the MEMS microphone, capital M-E-M, -E lowercase s. And basically this microphone was, uh, it's not calibrated, it's, it's basically a more accurate microphone so that it, it it's not a, a bigger DV, the, the tolerance of this microphone is much better than the, um, the measurement microphone they were using since the year 2007, I want to say, or 2006, whenever version one of ARC came out. And why that's important is because even like a decibel or two can make a difference when it comes to these measurements. So I got the MEMS microphone and yes, it made a difference. Was it like super significant? It's hard to tell. But the big revelation for me, number one, so after version, after ARC 2.5 came out. Sonarworks, um, which is a company in Latvia, I think it's called Latvia. I don't know if that's a city or a country. I'm I'm sorry for my ignorance, but anyway, they're from Latvia, and um, they contacted me out of the blue, and they were like, "Hey, we we got this um, we got this speaker measurement software, and they it also works with headphones. Would you like to check it out?" And I said, "Sure." So they sent me um, one of their measurement microphones and gave me a, a license for Sonarworks reference. I think it was version three at the time. And um, wow. So when you wear headphones that are calibrated, it gets the room acoustics out of your audio. And, and it's important because people always give me a bunch of grit, we'll say, because I have this, you know, my, my mixing setup is, is in a corner. But here's the thing. It's not like this is a. It's not like this wall right here's, um, you know, like flat up and down. Like it, it it bends. So I like the way that this sound. I, I know how music is supposed to sound in this corner. Um, not to say that I don't have different issues with room resonance or whatever. In fact, it, it might even be picking up on this omnidirectional lavalier microphone. But um, you know, my ear had my ears have become accustomed to the way that my speaker system sounds. And, uh, but if you're a new sound engineer, I honestly believe that headphone mixing and, re and recording may be the ticket if you're using Sonarworks Reference, which is now called Sound ID, by the way. Um, or if you have the money, Slate VSX. Slate VSX essentially takes the concept of the highly calibrated speaker microphone um, 
measurement microphone, which is what the MEMS microphone is, which, and I believe that that is better than... Now, now Sonarworks, to their credit, what, they, what, what made them different, IK Multimedia did not measure each calibration microphone before they sent it to you. Sonarworks did. And that made a difference because I actually got two different measurement microphones. There was a problem with one of them. I think the noise, I thought the noise was too loud or something. The program was giving me, it was giving me error messages. So I got two different measurement microphones sent to me and by golly, they were different calibrations. So, um, and you could also get your actual individual headphones calibrated by them. Now you had to obviously ship it to Latvia, which can be expensive. And then the, or you could buy headphones directly from them, which I think was the better option. It's cheaper with shipping and all that. So, um, but if you had headphones that you already liked and you spent a lot of money on them, you know, it might be the cheaper option actually. So anyway, um, they, you know, it, it came with preset calibrations if you wanted to, but the estimate was, it was about, you know, two, negative two to plot, plot positive two, um, accuracy but if you got them to calibrate it i think it went down to like 0.5 decibels or somewhere around there um, a lot more accurate to have your your headphones custom calibrated with their system but then slate came out and basically they were like okay so this is what we're going to do we are going to make our own headphones we're going to make sure that they are calibrated within a very tight tolerance and instead of just giving you a flat response with speaker with, with, um, with headphones, we're going to make that flat response then sound like it's coming out of, you know, like these high end studio speakers in these nice, nicely acoustically treated rooms. And, um, and, and in addition to that, um, you can also have these speaker simulations in like a car, an SUV, a movie theater, a dance club. So VSX came out and I, to me, VSX was a, I mean, obviously there was an evolution there with ARC starting it off and then Sonarworks reference and then, but VSX I think to me is what I would recommend to everybody. Cause number one, oh my goodness, like, like even like this, this cheap speaker system that I have is like 150 bucks. You know, I have a subwoofer over there off camera. You can't see that was like 320. So VSX. Okay. Yeah. You, you look at it and you're like, man, like the cheaper package is 300 bucks. So I'm spending $300 on a pair of headphones. Well, you're not just getting headphones. You're also getting the software to go along with it. And I'm telling you, if you want to get started on the right foot, get slate digital VSX. I'm recommending that. I do not have affiliate marketing with them. I don't have any association with Slate Digital other than one time I interviewed um, Stephen Slate like back in, I think, the year 2013, I want to say. But, um, you know, ever since then, I haven't really, I, I barely even check out Slate Digital's releases. Um, not that I don't like them. I'm just saying, like, in general, I just, I think the last plugin I got of theirs was the... Um, the FG Stress, which by the way is an awesome plugin. If 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 you, if you want to get your first compressor, a distressor plugin or the real deal is what I would recommend. So um, anyway, monitoring super important. I recommend VSX for recording and mixing, and um, you can't go wrong with that setup. Let me, let me speaking of calibration. Making sure my sink is in sync. This is another item that I highly recommend getting because you're probably going to record voiceovers and voiceovers. Well, this is a Stedman Pro Screen XL, the more expensive version out of the two. It's a little bit bigger. I think that the this gooseneck might be a little bit sturdier. I, I, I don't know. You can get a cheaper one, the, the, the regular Pro Screen um, but Stedman, I've had this for oh, easily over a decade, and this thing just, it, it's a, it's a, it, it's a problem solver. I was going to say a lifesaver, but that, that's the wrong word. It's a problem solver. 
So the Stedman Pro Screen XL is a pop filter. You might see cheaper ones that just use like, it looks like a pair of pantyhose or something. But um, this basically uses, I believe this is plastic, um, but it's plastic that real, it redirects, like if I go, instead of it going forward, instead of the wind going forward, it, it's hitting my finger that's like right here. So, whoa, ouch, ouch. <laughs> So yeah, where I have my finger, the wind blast is not hitting that. It's it's going right down and hitting, it's it's redirecting the wind. So it, this, th this was, I, I will never get rid of this. I will never sell this. If it breaks, I'll replace it. I think it was $75 when I got it. Now I do recommend this. And if you want to use my Amazon affiliate link, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so interface choice. I talked about how much I like the Audion ID14. Is it the best audio interface though? No, no. I mean, first of all, there's ones that have more inputs. There's ones that have more stable drivers. And I'm gonna go down that list right now. Okay, first of all, if you want the most stable audio interface out there, that's gonna work from Windows 98 all the way up until Windows 11 you got to go with RME. RME has the most rock solid drivers out there. They make their own drivers. They're not using, uh, I think it's called Thriscon, like a lot of the companies out there are. They are just a great company and they have rock solid drivers. However, are their microphone preamps the best? Oh, well, I guess it kind of de depends on what you mean by the best. Um, they're a little bit on the clean, transparent side, so there's nothing wrong with RME microphone preamps, but some people might think they're a little bit boring. Audient preamps have been described as similar to API. Now, I can't vouch for that because I don't have any API preamps, but I can say that the things that I've recorded with the Audient interface have uh, meshed well with a real API 5500 equalizer. So take that advice as you will. The problem with Audion is it's just not as stable as RME. Um, you know, also they, it doesn't have a MIDI in and out. So I'm looking personally at a Motu interface, Mark of the Unicorn. This company has been around for a very long time and um, they, they're good too. I, I believe they make their own custom drivers as well, but they may not be as stable as RME. But from what I've heard, they're pretty darn close, but it's hit or miss. Everybody says RME has great drivers. I don't think I've seen a single person ever disrespect RME, but Motu I've heard hit or miss. I actually um, sent an email to Motu asking to review their new, I think it's called the M6 uh, audio interface. So I'm gonna actually, I never heard back, so I'm gonna call up their marketing person, if I can remember to, tomorrow, and, um, and ask them again if they would like somebody to review the M6, because I don't see any M6 reviews up here on YouTube. But the M2 and the M4 got solid reviews. The cool thing about the M6, it has two different, um, line outputs it has two different headphone outputs it has midi in and out it has let's see i think it's usb powered and also can be wall powered and oh it has front panel input levels which i know the id14 doesn't have i mean i, I pretty much use the doll inputs but uh, it's cool to have that as a feature and i think it has a bunch of line inputs as well so I think it has four instrument slash microphone slash line inputs on the front. And then on the back is a bunch of line inputs. So um, it, it's good if like, for example, I can plug, the, plug it in right from line output two into this. I also have another compressor um, and I could be able to not have to disconnect my speakers. Like if I use the ID14 with the 1176 compressor, then I have to disconnect my speaker, one of my speakers, or just use my headphones, which eh, 
maybe I want to do that anyway. But um, anyway, it's not exactly the easiest thing to accomplish with the ID14. Now the ID14 Mark II is a different story. Focusrite's another good company. Again, I've heard the drivers are hit or miss. The mic preamps, at least for the Scarlet series, may not be the best. But uh, the Claret series, nice. They are also are made out of metal, I should mention, um, which isn't always apparent, but I've seen these interfaces in person at the AES convention, and yes, indeed, they are made out of metal. So earlier I talked about sample rate. My recommendation for recording most of the time is just 24-bit 96 kilohertz. Now, technically a microphone like this can record up to 192 kilohertz. Pun intended, it's overkill for the most part. I mean, if, if you want to, if you want to record 192 kilohertz, knock yourself out. You won't have to do any oversampling because the oversampling is done for you. But I, for one, prefer still to this day 96 kilohertz because every plugin works with 96 kilohertz it's not going to be eating up too much cpu um most of the time you're not going to need to use oversampling. 96 kilohertz just to me is like the the optimal sample rate um, for for most purposes now if you got to record lower 48 kilohertz minimum is what i recommend i don't like to record at cd quality a lot of audio engineers say you may as well because you're going to be you know mixing down to that anyway i'm like eh, i'll stick to my 96 but a lot of times you may only be able to record up to 48 if you have a bunch of inputs like eight at inputs and they can only go up to 48 kilohertz because you're not using what's called smucks and anyway that's getting into too many details bottom line is bare minimum record at 48 kilohertz and you'll be happy file format wise now this is where we get into a big can of worms on a mac i would say record in aiff or aif format which i think is called the apple apple intermediate format or something on windows it's wav wave wav how you how you pronounce that um Sometimes I'll actually record FLAC files if I'm just recording something off the internet using loopback, but um, that's a very rare occasion. If I'm recording somebody's voiceover or music, I don't record FLAC because you're, you're using more CPU doing that and it might cause glitches. But um, realistically, with newer computers, I don't see why you couldn't technically record FLAC, um, but you don't ever want to record MP3 don't record Opus, don't record AUG, don't ever record lossy formats. I mean, that's just, you're just asking for trouble when you go to mix it. Um, it, it funny to say, if I recorded audio using this camera, um, it records an AAC. So it's recording to a lossy audio format from the get-go. And the only way around that, I believe, is if I use a program, uh, an app called Filmic Pro, and even then, it, it, there's there's other problems that present themselves um, when, when using outside apps. But so I try to use the built-in camera whenever the, the built-in camera app because it helps with audio sync. But watch me uh, eat my, eat those words because this is the first time I've recorded a lengthy video um, and and tried to sync it up. Um, using using this but uh this records at 48 kilohertz i should say and i got one more page so while i'm thinking about it i'm going to hit the stop button and um i'll be back <laughs> 